Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're going to cover the Quant versus Actuary second video. The first video, which I'll throw a link up here and one in the description below as well, um, is covering just kind of like the comparison of careers, um, academics, kind of just a little bit of the overview of what's the difference between an actuary and a quant. This video itself is going to dive into um, an interview. So I sent out some questions to one of our subscribers, Shawshank. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Um, a huge thank you. Like this makes the channel so much better because you have been an actuary. Um, you have the background. You're answering some questions. I also like that uh, he is from India. So this is going to give you a completely different spin because everything I give you for the most part comes from the U.S. perspective. And I know a lot of you are coming from Europe uh, and India as well. But his Indian background um, actually works with the actuary qualifications, which we're going to dive into here in a second from the UK. Um, but he's going to do, I'm going to read through his interview here, and then I'm going to give you an answer to the similar question. Let's just give his kind of introduction real quick. Um, he says, I was a member of the Institute of Actuaries of India from 2008 to 2016. Also a member of the Institute of Faculty of Actuaries UK from 2010 to 2015. Um, I have worked in various actuarial roles for four years in India in both life insurance and consulting, I even worked in a boutique wealth management firm to help set up their risk strategy. He had cleared seven of the exams and had studied two of the core technical subjects. Um, so interesting background, right? Consulting is something else you can do with actuarial background and kind of expertise here. Uh, quants do some consulting, but that's really not our focus. And a lot of us don't actually get into that realm. So my background quickly is that I work in risk management. I've been doing it for about four or five years now. I have eight years of corporate finance, marketing, analytics, and accounting background at a startup company before that. I have a master's in applied economics and financial engineering from the University of Michigan. Uh, and I also went to Washington State University with an undergrad in finance. So the first question here is education requirements. Um, for this actuary here, you know, you said in India, there is no requirement. You just need to finish high school. And then the IAI conducts an entrance test. But it's not really possible without being proficient in mathematics. For the UK, for the actuarial side, um, he mentions that, you know, it requires you to have some high school grades. Um, that are fairly high in the mathematic realms as well. But in general, like you need to be educated, you need to have a mathematical background really to dive into this actuarial side, given his perspective and the information that he is providing here. So now on the quant side, educational requirements, um, you have to have at minimum a master's in something quantitative. Uh, typically, this is a master's in financial engineering, computational finance, financial mathematics. Um, I've also seen though master's in statistics, um, applied economics, econometrics. Um, and that's just the bare minimum where a lot of people in the industry also have a PhD as kind of the introductory degree to get going. But both of those, either a master's or PhD is the bare minimum. Um, you have to have those in some quantitative field to really dive into risk management. So the second question here is certification requirements on the actuarial side. Um, India follows the UK exams pattern and requirements. So if you're going to be an actuary in the UK um, or if you're going to be an actuary in India, you have to take these following exams. Um, there's 15 exams in total, nine core technical subjects. So CT one through nine, uh, either by examination or exemption, three core application subjects, CA one and two, CA three or CP three, uh, either by examination or exemption, uh, two specialist technical subjects, either by examination or exemption, one specialist application subject by examination or dissertation, uh, work-based skills, personal and professional development, uh, professional skills course. If you have not yet taken this course, you must do so within 12 months of becoming a fellow. With the CT and TA exams, you can become um, an associate actuary. Uh, depending on your SA and ST exams, one can clear. Um, you could become either a health actuary, life actuary, pension actuary, general insurance actuary, finance slash investment actuary or risk actuary. So I think it's important here to note that he's showing you there's all these different areas within actuarial sciences that you can work. Um, so again, passing all these exams, all these requirements is key to becoming an actuary in the UK um, in India. And also I'm um, echoing this tr through, right? This is also equivalent in the US, you have a list of exams you have to take, which I mentioned in the first video. And then as he points out here, if you want to know more information on this, there's this link in this document. I'm gonna link it below as well so you can get more details on being an actuary in the UK. So certification requirements for being a quant, 
There's none, there's none. If you have the education I mentioned before, that's it. Uh, popular certifications you can get is kind of like an add-on is like the FRM, so financial risk management designation, um, the CFA, chartered financial analyst, but in general, there's really not a quant designation or a quant certification. All right, so I think this is probably the most important question of both of them. What is the most valuable skills for the job? So for the actuarial side here, uh, he listed out, you know, communication, both written and verbal, ability to explain complex things in a simple manner is very important, ability to work with numbers, complex problem solving, emotional intelligence, people management, coordination with others, uh, judgment and decision making, hands on with tools like Excel is the bare minimum. So now to answer the most valuable skills from the quant side, um, I would say communication again, like he mentioned for the actuary side, communication is key. We work in a highly technical area, but that being said, a lot of the times when you're working with others, uh, their managers or senior levels, um, and so they might not have the expertise that you have, and so you have to simplify things in communication. I would say the second portion here is mathematics and statistics have to be super, super heavy. A lot of times we have problems and you're working through them and they're not clear cut answers. This isn't something you can just look up online or like open a textbook and find the answer. So being able to find these like different solutions on your own mathematical judgment and expertise, being able to write equations out, you know, rewrite them in different manners, looking at how the parts interact and trying to figure out the complexities behind the equation. I think it's something crucial to being a quant. So the third one here is going to be computer programming. I think this is crucial for quants. I think this is what separates us a lot from like actuaries and um, data scientists and other degrees. A lot of quants, depending on your area, will have some specialties. So I work in the risk management realm. Uh, my specialty is programming in statistical languages such as R, SAS, uh, and Python. Whereas if you work more on the algorithmic trading side, uh, even in like the quant research, you have to be able to program in statistical languages as well as other hard languages such as C++. But again, I think this is what really defines a solid quant um, from essentially like a statistician or someone who's not really a quant, as those people don't typically enjoy the programming as much as a real quant would enjoy. So the next question is, what is the average day like? In an insurance company, an actuary would work on principal product management or valuation reserving. Uh, usually one analyst would be working on a project from end to end. Uh, whereas in a consulting environment, you would be doing some technical part of a project repeatedly. So I think this is good here. You get kind of a taste of if you work in consulting, you might be an expert on one thing and just do it over and over again. Whereas if you're an actuary, um, you'll be doing projects from end to end. Again, as he points out here, these are just generalizations. So depending on the firm you work for, depending on the type of actuarial like studies you're working in and in industry, um, it's going to change depending on your role and depending on your expertise, experience, and exams passed. An average day would involve working in a lot of spreadsheets, meetings and calls with different stakeholders. Um, in insurance particularly, work could be cyclical with more pressure at the end of the fiscal year, end of quarter when reporting is due. So for the actuarial side here, I think it's crucial to kind of pull out this little piece here that it's very cyclical if you're working in the insurance or even in the finance side. Um, somebody working in banking, I can tell you it's there's some cyclicality here and so there's a lot more pressure as you go through the cycle. All right, so the average day for a quant, I think this depends a lot on the different areas. Again, I'm just gonna give you my perspective as someone who works in risk management at a bank. Um, the average day for me is basically coming in, sitting down, um, going through all my emails for the beginning of the day, and then going through a lot of different models. So typically as a risk management quant, you specialize in one area. You can be a credit risk uh, kind of analyst or officer, you can work in market risk, you can work in operational risk, you can do PPNR, and even a lot of times you'll do like a C car, which kind of covers a lot of different things. Uh, but in general, you have some specialty, but for me, an average day kind of jumps around. I go from time series, I go to logistics and credit risk and auto portfolios. Um, again, those time series are coming out from the CCAR side. We have CECL and Basel regulations kind of coming in. So my average day really comes into the fact that I program a lot in SaaS at our bank. Uh, other banks use R and Python. Again, you'd be programming a lot in this. So contrasting this with the actuary, he mentioned you'd be doing a lot of spreadsheets. Uh, again, I'm sure there are lots of actuaries who work in statistical languages as well, but being a risk management um, specialist here, like 80% of our day is probably focused in programming, uh, analyzing charts, and then the last 20% is all like documentation, uh, writing reports up, meeting with model developers, and kind of going through what their requirements are, if they passed, if they didn't pass, kind of those types of aspects. 
Uh, but again, that's kind of the day of Equan. It's mainly focused in programming, statistics, and documentation. So work-life balance here for the actuary. Uh, he mentions here it depends and can vary a lot by company. I cannot agree with that more uh, from the quant side as well. But he said on average, you know, in a corporate environment, it's not very hectic. Uh, you normally work 40 hours a week. And he mentions also that you can spend some of your time studying for exams along with the work can be challenging as you're trying to do both at the same time. Uh, Work-life balance, working in risk management. I think it's very cyclical as kind of the actuary mentioned in their other question. Um, if you work specifically in like a C-car environment, everything will be very cyclical. You'll have lulls and you'll have really stressed periods and then lulls and it's very predictable. Um, someone who works more in the just general banking environment, doing models for all different things, C-car, Basel, internal model use, profitability, those types of things. We're busy almost 12 months out of the year. Again, it's not very hectic. I think in general in risk management, which is one of the things I absolutely love about it. Um, the companies I've worked for in general have been very flexible. Again, this can depend on where you work, but I have the ability to work from home and many of the jobs I've been in. And then if you have like a doctor's appointment or something, they're really flexible and like, you know, just go get it done and then come back and get your work done for the day. So overall, I think work-life balance in the quant world seems fairly similar to the actuary world. Um, you're gonna be busy, you're gonna have times like where you're a little more stressed out, but overall, um, kind of the nine to five, less hectic, but again, a little bit more pressure when you have the cyclicality, uh, different reporting coming in, but in general, kind of a relaxed and more of a fun environment to work in, at least from my perspective. So the final question here is advice to youth looking to enter into this field. So for the actuarial example here, uh, he has written, I am pivoting in my career now, but I feel I will always be an actuary. I rather think of myself as a risk professional now. So he actually went from the actuarial sciences side and is switching over to risk management, more on the quant side. Um, he also mentions, I feel actuarial is too siloed into just insurance or pensions. It is important for actuaries to venture into different fields and show their worth there. So that's kind of his response here. Um, he's switching over because he feels it's too siloed. All right, so the advice for youth looking to kind of join in to the risk management side and kind of the quant realm. Um, if you don't really love statistics, mathematics, and programming, all three of them, I don't think you should consider being a quant. If you love statistics, but you don't really like doing a lot of hard math, and you don't really like to do tons of programming, um, go be a statistician. You'll do some programming, but you'll do statistics. Uh, but in general, you need really all three of those to be a high hitting, like super successful risk management or quantitative finance professional. So I hope this gives you guys kind of a good kind of contrast into quants and actuaries. I think they're really similar in a lot of ways. Uh, I think a lot of the separations as pointed out kind of this interview is that actuaries are really pocketed into insurance and pensions. They can do some other finance stuff. And yeah, they have backgrounds. They could learn to do other things. But in general, having an actuarial degree and passing exams really specializes you on the actuarial side. And I think this even holds true on the quant side. Uh, being a quant and having like a financial engineering background really pockets you kind of into the risk management, uh, investing, and like quantitative research aspects of the finance world. Um, I think it's hard to move from being a quant to traditional banking. Um, I think it's hard moving from a quant to being an actuary. And I think the flip holds true for actuaries. It's hard to be a quant. It's kind of hard to move out of that role into other areas. Um, but again, if you really like what you do, so for example, I love uh, quantitative finance. I absolutely love working in risk management. Uh, if that's what you like, definitely pursue it. If you really like actuarial sciences, you think insurance is really inter interesting and pensions are interesting, like dive on in and be an actuary. But I'm hoping this kind of gives you a little bit of contrast, a little bit of flavor of kind of the two jobs. Um, and also kind of his perspective here on why he left actuarial sciences to become um, a risk management professional. And again, how he still considers himself an actuary, um, even though he's kind of leaving that area. But again, he's still taking all those skills and expertise he learned uh, from the actuarial side into the risk management realm. Anyways, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.